Um, my name is Andy Hainer, and uh, I've got a wife and three kids. I've been married for 22 years to my best friend. We just celebrated our 22nd wedding anniversary. Uh, I've got a son who's 16 years old. He loves Jesus and, and respects and obeys his mommy and me. Loves his sisters, drives them around to places and stuff like that. I've got two daughters, Noelle, she's 15, and I've got a 10-year-old Phoebe, and she can do anything that the other two can do, just ask her. <laughs> if, and if she can't, it's not fair. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the way she is. She rolls pretty hard. Um, so i um, been here, what, this is probably my, my third, fourth time, something like that. And this is my favorite, one of my favorite places to preach. I, I just have to let you know that. And the reason is, is because, you know, sometimes you got, you, you're speaking to people who don't realize how much they need Jesus, how deeply uh, twisted we are on the inside and how much we need God to untwist us and, and things like that. And I tell people, I said, look, God did not send His Son to die on a cross to shed His blood to get your butt into a building on Sunday. Amen. He sent His Son to get all the junk out of you that the devil and the world and your life has put in there and so that He could put Himself inside of you Amen. because you were not meant to be a container of peace pain, of shame, of guilt, of, of sin, of lying, manipulation, of rejection. You weren't meant to contain that in your heart. You were created to be a container of the living God. Amen. That's why you were created empty. Because God <laughs> planned to fill you. But unfortunately, you and I got kidnapped. And somebody else started putting, pouring their junk into us. And that's pretty yucky, isn't it? Some of y'all, I just have, uh, I, I've really been blessed. I'm going to share a little bit more about this conversation, but um, one of the things that God allows me to do is I get to travel around to, to different churches, different regions, and things like that, and I teach them about the significance, the big picture of who Jesus is, uh, what He's done. And not only just who Jesus is, but now that, now that He's inside of you, who you are. <laughs> Do you understand that sometimes, you know, we've got ideas and concepts about who we are that we didn't learn from Jesus. We learn them from our experience. We learn them from our failures. We learn them from our mom or from our dad or from, from the people who weren't there for us and from all the stuff that, you know, and we get those concepts of ourselves and we try to live life out of that concept. And man, that doesn't work too good, does it? You know, we need to, we need to just hit the reset button and find out who God created us to be, what God says about us, uh, and receive that and let that begin to have power in our hearts and then we our hearts are kind of like sponges aren't they you know whatever they're filled with whenever you get squeezed that's what comes out <laughs> right and so if you're filled with the truth of God the love of God the power of the Holy Spirit that when you get squeezed guess what happens Jesus juice just gets all over the place <laughs> you know and so my whole my whole desire is just just y'all just squeeze me, okay? I just want Jesus juice just to come all out on y'all. Uh, so that you, if you're feeling a little dry, you can just take a little bit of what I got and you can say, oh yeah, oh you know what? That reminds me of this well I got inside of me. I just, just drink it up on the inside, you know? A little bit about me is I came to know Christ after being high every day before my feet hit the floor for six months. So I just described a leave it to beaver kind of life. Married 22 years to my best friend, that kind of thing. I got three kids that love Jesus, that walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. That is, that's, that's an amazing blessing. I don't, I didn't create that. I couldn't hold that together. You know, that's the grace of God. 
But before I came to know Christ, I was a heartbroken college student who was drifting. And the reason I was drifting is because I was succeeding at everything I wanted. I had my heart broke one time by Miss JSU. I fell in love finally, you know. Girls used to just be a thing for me to do, you know. But this one girl, I finally opened my heart, you know. And then she got close enough to me to realize I wasn't as Christian as I was letting on to be. Right? And she broke up with me after... This is when I was first losing my hair. You know, I was was playing football and I I told her, I said... Man, I keep seeing more and more hair come off in my helmet. It's like I take my helmet off and there's a toupee at the top of it or something, you know. It's terrible. And, uh, and, and you know, a week before she broke up with me, she's looking in my eyes and she said, You know, Andy, I've imagined you bald. I could still marry you. And I didn't even ask her to marry me. But we were that in love, you know. I, I loved her and she loved me kind of thing. So I thought, you know. And then... About a week later, she stopped returning my calls. She was one of these non-confrontational people. You know, it took me three days of leaving the answer machine messages. I was responding like most insecure men would. You know, like, what's going on? Give me a call. Click. You know, finally I just showed up over there one day. And she said, I don't know how to say this. I really don't. It's not because my feelings towards you changed. It's because... I don't know how to say this. And, she, and I said, what? Just tell me. She said, you're not good for my relationship with God. Mm-hmm. And I said, what? You know, I, you know, I was ready for another guy. I was ready for I don't love you no more. But I'm not. It made me feel like I wasn't good enough for her. You know, or something like that. Like, you know, because I grew up Catholic and we got loopholes. <laughs> you know, you go to confession for all the stuff that you like to do. <laughs> That's what I thought. You know, you know I, didn't, I, I had no goal of really following Jesus. My only goal was to get into heaven. Right? And so I was trying to use Jesus and God and the church and everything that I could understand about God really to manage my life when I got into crisis. Oh God, please, you know, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. I want help out here. And at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, I do not want to be burning perpetually in a lake of fire for all the stuff that I've done wrong. Yeah. Now, As a Roman Catholic, in my mind, I thought what I needed to do is be more good than I was bad. But I was trying, I was hoping I could squeak in at 51% good. Because all the stuff I really enjoyed doing were over on the bad side. (laughs) A lot of them. Alright? You know, but that's not the gospel. I just need to let you know. God is, it's not about... Trying hard not to do the things you love. It's about catching a glimpse of who God really is. And your heart is so changed, you realize, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? You know, uh, it's falling out of love with all your sin and yourself. And you realize, wait a second, Almighty God stepped off of the throne of glory to live as a man on my behalf. To live, to, to, he wore diapers, y'all. If they had diapers back in Jerusalem and, you know, I mean, he pooed on himself. That's what the God of glory did. He had to learn to walk. He had to learn to talk. Why am I holding this thing? <laughs> Sometimes I walk around my house. Do you see my glasses? You see, and they're on your face, dude. <laughs> I come conscious again. He had to learn all that stuff. But you know what? He was doing he was already 100% righteous, wasn't he? He had already kicked Satan out of heaven. I mean, there was no problem. As soon as Satan rebelled, it was like, boom, you know, he's gone. And Satan goes, boom, and lands in a garden. And he looks like a snake in the garden. You know why? Because he had given man dominion on the earth. He has said, let us, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, He said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let them rule on the earth. 
Do you understand? And I want you to get this. When God created you, He created someone who would contain His image. His image. In His likeness. So that when anybody ever got, wanted to see what's God like, they would look at you and they would see how you talk and they would see the love and they would see the power and the wisdom and the mindset and they could see the invisible God being made manifest. That's amazing. That's what God created. And when He created you, He created a ruler. Let them rule on the earth. You know, that's why Satan had to end up in the garden. Because by that time, when God created us, that was the one place left on in the universe, visible or invisible, that God didn't have direct rulership. He had made us co-rulers so that as He filled us, as we walked in union with Him, that the invisible God would be made visible on the earth through the man and through the woman. And He gave them one rule, right, on the earth. Don't eat off that tree, right? One rule. That was the one rule. They were still on probation. They hadn't gotten to eat the tree of life. So that the life, the eternal life of God, would actually be ingested into man. And that we would now have the eternal life of God inside of us. We had fellowship with God on the outside, in the Spirit. We were innocent. We were bearing His image in all the ways that we could at that point, but we hadn't, made, we hadn't been fused. You understand? You know, when you, when you, take, when you take a tea bag and, and dip it down in the water, that tea just permeates psh, the water. You can't get that stuff separated anymore. I mean, probably some scientists could. But, you know, there's some, there's some alloys that once those things bond, psh, they're together. You can't get them apart. There's just no, no way that we know how to get those apart. That that's what God's intention was. He created us to participate in His life. In the same fellowship that the Father and the Son have been experiencing for all eternity. The Father pouring Himself into the Son. And the Son receiving the Father and imaging forth the glory of God. Right? Right? And the, and the Son then taking all that the Father is and loving the Father back. And how do they do this exchange? That's Holy Spirit. Because He doesn't do anything for Himself. He does everything for the Father and for the Son. They share one Spirit. And they've been like this for like eons and eons before there was even time. And, and, and one day they're like, I want to, let's make a visible universe. So that, so that we, can, we can enlarge this. We can make this visible. Let's, you know, this was, this was just... And so in this universe, let's make human beings, let's make someone who can make this visible. But when He made you and I in His image, you got to understand God's way of thinking about... We think of ourselves as kind of independent persons, don't we? You know, like, I'm not him and he's not me and uh, you, you do you, I do me kind of, kind of thing. We think of everything being separate, you know, like. But do you understand that the Father and the Son, they just consider themselves to be one. They're, they're different people, but they're one. They're not different like we think of different. They're distinct, but they're not separate. That's amazing to me. So, I mean, that blows my mind. And, and I'm not trying to, like, theologize with y'all. I'm trying to describe God. <laughs> because that, ultimately, that's the only solid rock for our life, isn't it? That's what, we, we are driven by relationships. We're built, we're hardwired to need love. We're hardwired to need truth. That's why you and I were made as containers. Do you understand that your mind is a container? You need wisdom. You need truth. You were born empty-headed, every one of you. And, and some of you were blonde and, and you stayed that way a little bit more. <laughs> but, but you know, there's a solution for that. Sorry, sweetie. <laughs> I'm looking around like, who did I get in trouble with? I uh, know you don't take offense at that because you're awesome. <laughs> You know, but then you get filled with the mind of Christ. Your mind was meant to con contain someone else's mind. 
so that you would never be alone having to figure stuff out. You'd go, what is that? And you'd have the mind of Christ in you and He'd say, this is what it is. What do I do, Lord? This is what you do. Lord, what about this? This. You know, it's just, wow. Do you know our hearts are created to need love, to crave love? God is love. You were hardwired looking for love, weren't you? And, and we're born, Jesus said, you're born, you walk in darkness. So we're out here going like this. We need love. We need love. And we're looking for it. But we were never meant to look for love. We were meant to contain it. So when you come back to Christ, what happens? Holy Spirit says the love of God is shed abroad in your heart. Now, all the love that you've been looking for, that's what repentance is, is that you realize, man, God loved me so much. Now, we have this... We have this terrible habit of basing our view of God and of ourselves on our experience of life, don't we? I mean, how many times have you seen people that are bitter at God because they had a rough life, right? So they've based their entire view. Even if there is a God, I don't want nothing to do with Him. Why did He take my four-year-old girl? You know, I mean, I mean, I, those are serious hurts, right? But they based their whole view on God, out of the junk that's happened out here. I, my uncle, he was in the Vietnam War. He went to Vietnam being just, you know, kind of an average churchgoer like most people thought he believed in God, good moral boy. Came back and he was just totally adamant. I can't believe in God no more after what I saw. Any God who would allow such things to happen. You know, that's what he had got his image of God for him. Do you understand that people are looking at life and they're saying, if that's what God's like, then I don't want anything to do with Him. Do you understand? And this is where I want to go, okay? John chapter 14. This is where we got to get to. John chapter 14. All right. So uh, I'm going to start, I guess, with a familiar verse. Verse 3, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you where? To myself, right? So where's this place going to be? It's going to be with Him. All right? That where I am, not where I'm going to be, where I am you may be there also. And you know the way where I'm going. And Thomas said, well, Lord, we don't even know where you are going. How do we know the way? You know, <laughs> you know that's a good GPS question, right? <laughs> you know, put in your destination. <laughs> I'm not putting my destination in. Just show me the way. <laughs> uh, you know, little Siri would go, sorry, it does not compute, right? <laughs> Recalculating. And Jesus says... I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to where? To the Father. To the Father. Jesus is leading us to the Father, but through me. So what is it? He's the truth that leads us to the Father. He is the way to the Father. He is the life of the Father. That's how we come to the Father. We come to the Father in the life, in the way, in the truth of who Jesus is. And He brings us right there. Now, he's, a lot of people read that and they think, oh yeah, see, Jesus is going to bring us to heaven. He's the only way to get to heaven. Listen, guys, He's bringing us into a relationship. He's bringing back, the, He's reconnecting us with the living God. we got to get this mindset out of our brain that Jesus hung upon a cross so that you can meet God and be accepted by God when you die. 
Do you understand that if you receive Jesus Christ, you have already died. You were crucified with Him and you accept that. And now what God has done is He's removed the barrier through Christ so that now He can come into you. You don't wait to meet God when you die. You come to Christ, you're dead, and now you meet God. You contain God so that now God can live in you. God can live through you. How? Not by you trying your best to make like you're godly and religious and you got it all together. But you contain someone else. You've just let go of all the other junk that was put inside you. You don't have to analyze that stuff. You don't have to fret about it. You don't have to try real hard to tweak it and prove it. You just let that stuff go. And you just say, man, I never, ever knew the truth about me. I never knew the truth about God. I never knew the truth about Jesus, except when I see it in here. That's the truth. He's the truth, right? Jesus said, I'm the truth. Everything else will drive you away from knowing the Father. Won't it? But He said, you want to know the truth? Right here, I am the truth. And what do we see? Somebody brilliant. Well, Jesus goes on and he says, If you had seen, if you had known me, you would have known my Father. From now on, you know him and have seen him. And Philip, bless his heart, he says, Lord, show us the Father. It's enough for us. Right? I love this. This is, you know, most of the church that really believes in the presence of God and the reality of God is right where Philip is. Show us your glory! And they're hoping for some cloud, you know. Or, you know, oh Lord, I want more of you. I need you, Father. I'm so hungry for you. And, and it sounds, you can, you can pray and sing those kinds of things in a right faith and a right revelation. But for a lot of people, what they're really saying is, I have a, a strong desire to be very, very close, to really, really know the reality of God. But I'm still way on the outside. And I'm asking God to come down out of heaven and to open up, you know, that's how. And so there's still this whole mindset of separation. And Philip, and Philip said, Lord, just show us the Father. It sounds really passionate. I have a passion for Jesus. Just show us the Father. You know, can you hear that? It's the right thing. Show us the Father. And Jesus says, have I been so long with you and you have not come to know me? And it wasn't, guess that was Jesus' mouth speaking. But who did Philip ask to, ask to see? The Father. Guess who jumped forward and said, Have I been so long with you and you have not come to know me? Do you understand that Jesus had reclaimed the very destiny, purpose, and place that human beings were created for? He was a container of someone else. He was living in union with His Father. He, he, over and over, He said, Look, if you are seeing something in Me, it's not Me that you're seeing. It is My Father. Isn't that awesome? How many of you are? Who, how many of you feel like you know? I could never be as awesome as Jesus. Do you know Jesus couldn't be as awesome as Jesus? <laughs> it was his father. He had learned to contain someone else who is awesome, right? And so you are at a really good place if you've come to this place and realize, you know what? I can't live life on my own. With me trying to make it a go, it doesn't go. It goes in and man, I hit that wall. And the bad thing about it is sometimes I got people in the car with me. Ah, you know, we can't have that no more. It's, and so, but look... If you want to know how much God loves you, some of you have had horrid stuff happen to you. Somebody else got the good parents. You got the jerks. You got the abusers. You got the neglectors. Somebody else got the good husband. I thought I had one. I got a real, I got a doozy of a husband. Just about killed me. 
kind of thing, you know? Some of y'all have had some real bad stuff, and then the enemy tries to come in with this accusation. Well, God's trying to teach you something because you didn't get it right the first time. Or, why, God, did you allow this to happen to me, right? The accuser comes in and says, get your identity of God from this from the worst that's gone on in your life, you know, or get your identity for a, a view from this that's gone on in your life. Let me tell you a little story. Um, when I first started learning that the Christian life is the life that Jesus lives inside of us, the life that He lives through us, when I stopped trying to live the Christian life and let Jesus live the Christian life in me and through me, and I just started loving Him and just, just letting Him fill me, and letting him be himself, he's really good at being himself. He is good at being awesome. He's really good at that. But we're not used to learning to contain someone who's awesome. We're used to Jesus being awesome, but we need to get used to Jesus being awesome in us. Right? So I started learning about this stuff. And one of the things I started learning is Jesus will still do miracles today. Jesus will still heal the sick. Jesus will still cast out the demons. Jesus will still raise the dead. So I started going down to this uh, college campus and I'd hang out down there for a little bit. God, I got to tell you, when I share a testimony, the only reason I share a testimony is not so y'all would look at me, but so that you would realize that what God will do through that guy, he will do through me. Because I'm every bit of, as much as a born again son of God. So when I share these stories, it's not to impress y'all about me. Got it? All right. You will see. But I need to tell that kind of up front because sometimes people got, they're touchy about miracle stories. You know, sometimes some people are. Anyway, I've learned that. I'm on y'all. <laughs> anyway, so I'll get up to the college campus. I'm sitting down at a bench and, and there's this guy who comes and sits down next to me. And I started to try to start a conversation. It wasn't going so well. He wanted to be real quiet. And, and so finally I just said, man, you must need a miracle in your life. What's going on? And he looked over at me like really strange. And I I said, I know that's a strange question, but look, I'm not even a student up here. And, and, be, and I come up here during my lunch hour and I pray. I said, God, just put me next to people that need miracles. And I sat down on this bench a long time ago and you could have sat anywhere on this campus and you came and sat down on my bench. You must need a miracle. What's going on? And he, and he, at first he wanted to debate about God and miracles and all this kind of stuff. And, and I just didn't take any of the bait. I said, look, I'm not asking what you believe. I'm not trying to change your belief. All I'm asking is what, what do you need God to do for you? What, what miracle do you need? And he said, all right, well, to be honest with you, I got mad at God when I was 12 years old. And uh, I told him uh, that, you know, where to find me. He said, the reason is, is I've got constant pain in my body. And it's been there since I've been 12 years old. I said, and he said, I've been mad at God ever since. And I said, you've been mad at God. I said, man, this is awesome. Because I'm telling you, you know what God did for you? Is He sat you right here because He wants to show you what he's, that, who He is. And I said, does it hurt right now? He said, yeah, well, you know, it comes and goes. I said, does it hurt right now? He says, yeah, it always hurts in my legs, but it moves all around. I said, no problem. Is it okay if I put my hand on your legs and pray for you? He goes, whatever. You know, so like he's really full of faith right now. You know, he's like, knock yourself out, whatever, man. Just do your thing and go away. That's what he's thinking. I get, I lay my hands on his legs and just, just get ready to put my hands on his legs. And he goes, ow, dude, stop, that hurts. And I said, right now in Jesus' name, everything causing him pain, you go, get out of him now. And uh, sure enough, he, he started moving around, and, and he's got this confused look. And I said, stand up, move around. And he stood up and started moving around. And I said, it's, it's better, isn't it? He, says, he said, yeah, it actually... But, you know, then he reached in his trench coat pocket, and he pulled out these painkillers. He said, could, could be these. I said, you take one of those while I was praying for you? He goes, no. Yeah, like he's looking for his pain. He can't find the stuff anymore. And I said, look, here's what it is, man, is that when you were 12 years old... You started experiencing this pain. 
and you, and you started thinking, why is God allowing this? Or why is God doing this? And you started asking God, you know, please help me. And then it seemed like nothing happened. And, and that whole time, you were, you were thinking, well, if God's real, He doesn't care. Or, or, or part of what was probably going on is you were starting to figure out, well, what's wrong with me? That God won't love me? That He won't help me? Did I do something wrong? Well, I did do that other thing the other day. Well, God, please forgive me. You know, that whole guilt trip thing. You know, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Or, you know, then you try to make things up. And, but nothing changed in your body, did it? No. And so I said, look, God just set you free. Because He wanted to show you He wasn't doing that. Jesus said it's the thief that comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. I've come that they might have life. Jesus said, if you knew Me, you would know the Father. That if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? Amen. Okay. Let me ask you this: How many people did Jesus go around making sick? <laughs> Even if they needed a good lesson, I mean, come on, guys. Peter needed some good lessons, didn't he? Jesus ever say, "Peter, you're such a numbskull. Here's some tuberculosis until you get it figured out." No, never did anything like that, did he? <laughs> you know, I'll heal you when you repent. <laughs> Nothing like that. But how many, how many of us in the church, in the church, not just in the world, in the church are being taught? Well, you know, sometimes God allows sickness. How many people came to Jesus and said, Lord, please heal me? And Jesus said, you know what? I'm going to allow that to stay for just a little bit longer. He never did that. But yet we say such things about our Father, don't we? Amen. i got to tell you guys... <laughs> Jesus is the Word made flesh, right? How many of y'all ever played Legos? A few guys, a few girls. All right, there's, all right I'm not, I'm, I kept myself out of trouble there. There's some over here. All right. Now, you know you can get these Lego sets, right? And, and, and you see this picture on the box of this is what these, these Lego sets are supposed to be made like. But how many of you know you give these Lego sets to some of the kids and they're just going to start, you know, forget the box, you know, just empty the stuff out and I'll just start building stuff, right? Listen, the Word of God says this. In Hebrews chapter 1, it says that we know that God spoke in many ways and in many portions to our fathers, right? But in these last days, He has spoken to us in the Son. He is the Word made flesh. He's not a bit, piece, or a portion. That's all they got in the Old Testament. They got little bits, little pieces, little portions. And they never got the whole picture. How many of you know that Bible verses, you can make all kinds of screwball theology out of Bible verses? You really can. You can take the Bible verses are like puzzle pieces. You can take them and you can put them together and you can make a Tyrannosaurus Rex when you were supposed to be making a Starship Enterprise. Right? <laughs> Amen? Amen? How many of you know that there's, there's a church that goes around picket and soldiers' funerals saying, you know, God hates America and is glad that your soldier's in hell, and they got Bible verses. Mm. Right? And you got all kinds of screwball stuff out there. Guys, Jesus is not puzzle pieces. He's not Lego pieces. He is the picture on the box. He, if you know Him, you know the Father. And the Father is a healer. The Father is a Savior. The Father is merciful and kind and truthful and doesn't take any flack off of religious people. <laughs> you understand? And the Father... If you want to know God's love for you, Romans 5 verse 8 says this, you don't look at your circumstances, you don't look at your upbringing, you don't look at your background to see how, how, how worthy you think you are of the love of God. You look upon the cross where Almighty God in flesh and blood hung there with nails through His hands and through His feet and said, this much, this is your worth, this is your value, you to me. I will not share you with another. I will buy you back. I want you. I want you with me for all eternity. That's who our God is. You've got to understand that. 
Because Jesus, He said, if you've seen Me, you've, you've seen the Father. And in, in, Romans, uh, or in John 14, 18, He says, I won't leave you as orphans. I won't leave you as orphans. Do you understand that without God and without knowing Him as Father, without knowing Him as a Son... Do you understand that the only mindsets that we can develop are orphan mindsets? How many of y'all saw, uh, what was that Indian movie? It was about uh, the game show, uh, Slumdog Millionaire, all right? Now, there was, this was about some, some orphans that grew up in India. And you saw what it was like to be an orphan in India. And then this guy goes on, who wants to be a millionaire? And I, he, becomes a, he becomes a slum dog. He becomes a, an orphan. That's what they call the, the orphan slum dogs. And he became a millionaire, okay? I'm sorry I spoiled it for y'all. He, he won. <laughs> <laughs> he won. But here's the deal, is that you see the mindsets of an orphan. An orphan, if i got a problem, i got to solve it. You know, and truth and virtue and, and loving you really don't mean a whole lot to me. i just got to find out what you got that I need, and I'm going to find an angle to get it without getting in too much trouble. Do you understand? It's not about... You know, orphans don't do long-range planning. Do they? They don't think about, how can I leave a legacy for the next generation? They don't, they, that's just not the way orphans are. It's all about what I need and what, I got, what opportunities I've got before me. And they get their identity from everybody else around them. How much are you worth? Right? To them, nobody's ever treated them like they're worth much. So that's why they have to scheme and, and scramble and stuff like that. We used to think that when someone was born blind, that's because that's the way God wants them, right? We used to think that because somebody was born deaf, oh, that's because that's the way God wants them. We used to think that if somebody got in an accident and they became lame, oh, that's the way they're going to stay because that must be God's plan for their life. And then all of a sudden, Almighty God shows up in flesh and blood and says, you want to see what I do? Blind, blind boy, come here. Take your sight. Receive it. Say, Deaf boy, come here. Take your hearing and hear. Right? Lame man, I didn't give you lameness. I give you walk again. Do you understand? Rejected person. You know, how many of you guys were born sinners? How many of you know God doesn't want you to be a sinner? <laughs> right? <laughs> Is that okay? Jesus shows up and says, you must be born again. What's born of flesh is flesh. What's born of spirit is spirit. Hallelujah. Do you know that that's what made Him a son? It wasn't. That's what made Him awesome. It wasn't that He was smarter than everybody else. It, he just had a wisdom that surpassed the intelligence of man. Do you understand? that It wasn't that He had a physique that was stronger than everybody else. It wasn't His body. It wasn't His mind. It was the Spirit of God living inside of Him. Amen. Let, me, let me unpack this just for a second. I know it's like drinking from a fire hose, ain't it? This is big. I mean, that's why I'm going to be here for a few days. That's why I give myself a little extra time. Because I want you all just to be like sponges. Don't try to just so much analyze it. Just... All right, just take, just take Jesus in because all, all I'm doing is preaching gospel to you guys. Jesus is the gospel. I'm helping you get to know a person who is a rock who will set you free because He is the truth. And when you know the truth, boom, free baby. <laughs> Ain't that good? But we're so used to trying to know concepts and principles and, and, and trying to use all these little bits and pieces of the Lego to, to manage our life, right? we got to build it and all that stuff. Jesus comes whole. He's a complete package. And He moves inside of you and me. 
Let me tell you about my, a conversation I had with my friend. This was so awesome. It was such a blessing to me. I had been trying to help him understand who he was in Christ. But every time I started to describe the picture on the Lego box of who Jesus is and what Jesus had done and who he was in Jesus, he started saying, well, what about this piece? And what about this piece? And what about this? And finally, I just said, you know... Can we? Can you stop that and let me kind of get this out a little bit? You know, and then he took a little offense of that, and I thought, man, this is over. And so this week, you know, we're meeting again, and I say, okay, Lord, help get the breakthrough. You know, help him not be nervous, help him not be offended that I'm trying to help him, help me to be a good listener. You know, all them things. I because I'm not perfect. I, Jesus is perfect, and so Lord, help me to love him in the way that he needs to be loved. And he said, and so we talked a little bit, and he said, Andy. How about this? It's like he had this idea come to him. He said, how about I share with you what I think you're saying because I just had an idea. Holy Spirit just dropped something in on him, right? And I said, awesome, do it. And he said, when I was growing up, I had a deadbeat of a father. Uh, my mom and my dad divorced. And he didn't live with me. He never did anything for me. But as I got older, um, one summer, I was supposed to take some time and go live with him. So I took uh, a little bit of time and went and lived with him. And, you know, I really wanted to ride around and get in, in, in to have a bike, but I didn't have enough money for it. But my dad had this old bike. It, you know, imagine if Pee Wee Herman had left his, his bike out through the winter. You know, it was kind of rusty, you know, the old timey. Uh, you know, looking by, and and that's what he's describing to me. Y'all know Pee Wee Herman. Yeah. <laughs> One person doesn't. <laughs> okay, there's a few of you do. All right, this is an old 1970s Schwinn uh, bike or whatever. And he said, you know, I wouldn't want to be caught dead in that. So I worked a trade to trade some handlebars for some handlebars I liked. I worked a trade to get a new seat from the seat that I liked. I took those uh, rims off and, uh, and, and got some oil and did the chain. I painted the thing and it was looking pretty good. So I wasn't ashamed of it. So I decided I was going to take it out for a ride. I took it out for a ride. And after all this work, flat tire. And so I had to walk the thing back to the house. And I didn't have time to go get a new tire or nothing like that. And I was supposed to go out of town for the weekend. I was going to go away. And just before I left, my dad asked me, said, Son, is there anything I can do for you while I was gone? And I, I said to him, Dad, would you please um, you know, look and, and, and get uh, the tire, the flat fixed on my, on my bike? And he, and he said, he looked me right in the eye and said, You, you know I will. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you know, you never came through before, but I'm like, okay, you know, open your heart one more time. You know, you got to do that for dad, right? He's like, okay. Well, high degree of skepticism. He went away for the weekend. He came back, pulls up in the driveway, garage door hanging wide open, looks in the garage. There is the bike exactly where he left it. Flat tire still there. And he said, I got out of that car and I was just, I was, I was crying. I was so mad. I was, I was cussing my dad in my heart. I hated him. I, I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, it was more than about the bike. You know, he said, I, I knew it wasn't right. I just, I just, I was furious and I was afraid I would see my dad. So I ran in through the, through the garage door and I ran upstairs um, to go into my bedroom. I was afraid that if I saw him, I would start getting physical with him. And I opened the door and I, and I saw it. It was a brand new top of the line BMX racer sitting in my bedroom. And uh, I looked at it and he said, he, he said that it was the first time I ever cried tears of joy. And it was more than just about my bike. It was about my dad. He finally, he, it was like he finally loved me. You know, he, and he said, <laughs> and, and I, I said, so what does this have to do with what I've been telling you? And he said, and he said this, he said, it's exactly what you've been telling me, isn't it? He said, I've been mad because I've been trying to get God to fix up my old bike because and God gave me a brand new life, a brand new bike. He, he's not trying to give you Jesus so that you can get your act together. 
and have your identity, so to speak. You're going to have a good life. Do you understand that? But it's by letting Jesus, who's brand new, come and live inside of you. And that becomes... And here's the deal. How many of you have struggled with your view of yourself, with the self-image kind of thing, with your valuing of yourself? Here's what I want to tell you, and this is the big deal, okay? You were never meant to have a self-image. Stop trying to improve it. Just kill that thing. Because you were crucified 2,000 years ago. And you were meant to contain and participate in the image of God. God gives you Himself as your self-image. Do you understand that Christ is the image of God? And that you were crucified with Christ. And your image is, I contain Him. It's no longer I. It's Christ who lives in me. That's my value to God. That's who I am. That's who I am. The old is gone. How many of you know that my friend did not leave out of his bedroom and go and jump on his old bicycle? How many of you know that my friend didn't take the front tire off his new bike and put it on the old one? Do you understand so many times we're trying to get God to patch up the old because we still think that what God really wants us to do, He wants us to try hard and He wants us to do this. Do you understand? It's easy for Jesus to be Jesus. It's easy for God to be godly. It's His nature to love. It's His nature to be truthful, to be wise, to be stable, to be filled with peace and joy, to be self-giving and forgiving. He can't be otherwise. He's just and good in all of His ways. You can't change Him. Can your sin make Jesus unrighteous? No. No. Then if He is your righteousness... Hallelujah! (laughs) Do you understand that I share that with you? Not so that you can excuse your sin and carry on in your sin, but so that your sin doesn't hold on to you. You realize, I got on the wrong bike. Get off of it. Get back on Christ. And how I said, I said to my friend, I said, look, man, the only thing that could have made this a better illustration is if your dad had gotten you a Harley. <laughs> because nobody pedals Jesus down the street. He doesn't need your power. He comes with his own power. And all you gotta do is learn how to ride that puppy. <laughs> You know? That's what faith is. That's what love is. He's not looking to you to give him power and try your might. You got to learn how to rest. You got to learn to sit your butt on a seat. Right? Right. Not get off that thing. Because you are seated in Christ in heavenly places. That His victory for you, His victory is for you. When He came down to live a righteous life, He was doing the hard work for us. He was living the life that you and I owed God on our behalf. God, Father, You deserve perfect righteousness from humanity. So I take them into Myself by taking their flesh on as My nature. And I will live as a man on behalf of humanity a perfectly righteous life. And Father, there's been so much things that they've done. So I offer Myself to You as payment for their sin. So that, guess what? Not only are we brought back to zero like we've never sinned again. How many of you have heard that before? That's good. But not only are we brought back to zero. How many of you know it's better, uh, it's better to have no money and not be in debt than to be in debt? Amen. Right? So not only did Jesus pay our debt and say, okay, now you've got no money, but you're not in debt anymore. You don't have the creditors after you. He said, I'm giving you my credit card. <laughs> Because all of my righteousness is now credited to your account. 
Do you understand that you go before God clothed in the righteousness of Christ, filled with His Spirit, because it was the Spirit of Christ that came into you when you were born again. And God is Spirit. He doesn't know you from out here. He knows you from right in here. And He looks inside and He's like, this looks just like Jesus. I got them. I'm in them. This is cool, you know. <laughs> he just he's loving you on the inside. And when you when you're in the spirit, you get that love. You get to soak your soul and your mindsets, and that that same spirit will even touch your body. Romans eleven eight eleven says that if the spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He will give even life to your mortal body. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. You know what? When, when you buy a house, you have to pay for the upkeep. God owns me. He pays. He paid in advance for my healing and for yours. Because our bodies were not created to be a target for the enemy, for sickness and disease. How many of you know that? Right? How many there's people in here that have that have diseases in their body because of the way that they lived outside of Christ, right? And you think that you got to keep that because of oh it's a consequence for what I've done. You know when Jesus said, "Which is easier to forgive sin or to say rise up and walk?" So that you would know that the son of man has the authority to forgive sin, I say rise up and walk. Do you understand that healing, forgiveness, they go together. Why? Because Isaiah 53, what He did for our transgressions, He bore them in our body, in His body. He bore our transgressions, our pains, our sickness. He, he bore our transgressions so that we wouldn't have to bear them. How many of y'all done some transgressions, right? Done a few, one or two? Okay, I've done one or two. You know, how many of you sometimes have some guilt comes back on you? Try to say, say, you know what, you got to bear the guilt because you did it. What do you say? Wrong address. That package goes back to Jesus 2,000 years ago. Right? He bore my transgressions. He bore them in His body. Do you know what He did for, for, your, for your sins on the cross? He did for your sickness and disease at the whipping post. By His stripes we are healed. He bore our sickness. He bore our pain. It, that verse is quoted again in Matthew where it says that He stayed up, that they brought to Him people who were demonized, people who were suffering from all kinds of diseases. And it says that He healed them all and thus fulfilling what Isaiah prophesied, that He bore away our, our sicknesses, He bore away our pains. What is that? Isaiah was looking forward to that day when he suffered at the whipping post, stripes on his back. When he suffered on the cross, nails through his hands and he was pierced through. He was looking forward. Jesus is now on the spot. And the enemy's like, well, you hadn't paid that yet. Jesus said, I'm good for it. I'm good for it. I'm good for it. Guarantee it. And so he's healing people. I paid for it. I'm going to pay for it. I'm setting them free now. I'm carrying it out of their body. I'm carrying it. And there's this invisible pile of stuff that he's carrying around now. And then he pays for it at the whipping post and the cross. But he didn't just reach back. He reached forward. You understand? Your sins and mine were on him. How could that be? This gets really fun. Do you know if your granddad was shot, you wouldn't be here? If your dad was shot before you were conceived, you wouldn't be here. Why? Because you would be in his body, right? You'd be in your dad's body. You understand? So if your granddad, then your dad wouldn't have been here. So you go back, right? All the way back. So when Adam was kidnapped, we were in Adam, right? When he sinned and transgressed, we fell under the control of the enemy. 
And so now Satan's got humanity hostage. You can't throw me in the lake of fire, God. I got him. I got him. You can't do nothing. You know, right? I got your people. Guess what happens? God does not negotiate with terrorists. <laughs> you know what he did? <laughs> Satan's got the whole planet hijacked, right? And so you know what God did? He snuck a baby onto the planet who lived a perfect life for us. Who said, you know what? Just unload your clips on me, baby. You know, and Caesar. And then when and then when Jesus hears click, 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 he says, Into your hands, I just commit my spirit. And then guess what? Three days later, he comes back from the grave and he goes, Boo yeah, what you gonna do now, boy? That all you got? That all you got? Do you understand that's what He did for you and for me? Amen. He took your bullet. He took my bullets. Satan unloaded his clips on him. And it's over with. Now God says, now they're mine. They're free. Your kidnapper had you kidnapped up, locked you down in the basement, had your hands duct tape and your mouth tape, and he'd come down there and rattle them chains a little bit kick you around a little bit, whisper these lies. See, go ahead, go ahead, call on your daddy. He's the one who puts you here. He'd tell you them things, right? And you didn't know daddy broke in the house and up in the living room. Now he's got Satan all bound in the corner with his britches down around his knees and then his ankles taped and he's got his mouth gagged like this. And, and, he's, and, he's, and he's, saying, he's saying, come on out. Children, come on out. Come on out. I'm, I'm, not, I'm trying not. I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get that, guys. Because how many times does Satan try to intimidate you? Because you believe his lies. All right? Now, you need to understand that how many of you know that if you had a child, okay, that was kidnapped from your home at a very young age, that if you recovered them after five years being in custody of a demented kidnapper, that that child would have lies and pain and, and, and stuff going on in their hearts. But how many of you know that the parent's vision and value for that child never changed one bit? The whole time that that child was thinking, nobody loves me. Why did mommy let this happen? Why did daddy let this happen? Why won't they come get me? All that stuff that's going on in their heart the whole time you know you're going to be looking I loved you the whole time I never stopped I mortgaged my house I went homeless I did everything I could I went on the news I never stopped I loved you so much and you're going to be okay you're going to be okay and as soon as they begin to allow all, all that stuff that was in me all that stuff that I received all that time that it was a lie Amen. The reason it hurts when somebody calls you something is because you take it to heart. You believed it. You didn't know who you really were. How many of you know that Jesus Christ did not go around getting His feelings hurt and trying to manage people's image of Him? Do you understand that He didn't get His self-image from Mary? He didn't get it from Joseph. He didn't get it from His ministry, from His disciples, those booyahs that never could figure nothing out. <laughs> no way! He didn't do that. I mean, the last night, they're still fighting over who's the greatest and how many times have we had this discussion, boys? But yet Jesus washes their feet. And even one of those that had stayed with Him for three years betrayed Him for 30 pieces of silver. I mean, come on. Not even, not even how you would treat a friend. I mean, just give me lunch money or something. I mean, this is, this, I mean it was more than that, but come on. That's, you, you betrayed the Son of God and Jesus washed even Judas' feet. This was before Judas left for the evening. Nobody knew 
Why? Because Jesus was not trying to get acceptance out here. Jesus wasn't trying to fill His sponge from how other people thought about Him. Do you understand that other people's mind is a terrible place to base your happiness? Other people's acceptance is a terrible place to base your, your security. Other people's value in rejection is a terrible place to get your sense of value and worth. Everything that's going on up here is darkness. Other, the kidnapper is in all of the darkness. But Jesus came. He said, I've come as light into the world. And if you had seen the Father, if you had known Me, you'd have known the Father. Hallelujah. Do you understand that it's oftentimes we get presented the gospel that we've got mad daddy and good rescue Jesus? You know, God couldn't stand the sight of us. We were dirty, rotten sinners, and he is just going to come and crush our heads. And Jesus said, No, Father, help, you know, do to me, you know, that kind of thing. But we forget that 2 Corinthians says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. You don't have the Son without the Father. When you see the Son, you have seen the Father. That's amazing. We don't have a schizophrenic God. And I believe in the justice of God. I believe in all that He accomplished on the cross. But we we need to get our minds wrapped around this and our hearts wrapped around this, don't we? Do you understand that Jesus is with us? So if you're carrying stuff in your heart or if you're carrying stuff in your body that He paid to take out of you, then this is a good time to begin to just receive that truth. And this would be a good time to have some little ministry, I believe. Okay, So tonight and then tomorrow night, I'm going to really just try to nail this home. We're going to have a little time if people have sickness, disease, aches, pains, those kinds of things. I just want to let you know that Jesus still loves to do miracles. He still loves to help people. That's just His nature. And some of y'all might have seen some really kooky, corrupt people doing weird stuff, asking you for money on the television, okay? That's not what this is about. Jesus didn't give people the power of God so that they could raise money, you know? He said, freely you receive, so freely you give. You don't have to pay for this. Anybody tries to tell you you need to pay for something Jesus purchased is a hoodwinker. (laughs) <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, you know, they, you might want to support their ministry, <laughs> you know, so their kids don't starve and, you know, that kind of stuff. But freely you give, freely you receive. You know, the, that other stuff is, is, you know, is other. All right, so what I want to do is finish my little story. That one guy who... Uh, out at the college campus. I laid hands on him, and he was completely healed. And I said, look, you've been mad at God for 12 years. And the reason is because you thought this is what God's doing for you. God just showed you what He did for you. And look what He just did for your body, something you've been carrying for 12 years. What He did for your body, He will do for your heart. He wants to do for your whole life. But I felt that that was as far as there was grace in the interaction. Otherwise, he's going to start feeling, you know, now he's preaching at me kind of thing. So look, I left him pain-free with the name of Jesus and the truth of the gospel. And I said, look, I'm a busy person. I'm not doing this because I'm trying to recruit people or nothing like that. But if you ever want to call me, here's my business card. I am in full-time ministry. But listen, I'm not doing this because I want you to join nothing. I don't even have a church per se. I go around all over the place to do stuff like this. But if you ever want to, give me a call. How many of y'all know that Jesus healed people all the time? He healed ten ten lepers. One of them came back. I hardly ever have people take me up on that stuff. (laughs) So this is about the kingdom. This is not about church growth or your ministry growth. This is about the kingdom growth, okay? So you're so into the kingdom when you do stuff like this. So I, uh, I got a call from this guy that night. And he said, hey, this is so-and-so. Do you remember me up at the college campus? I said, yeah. He said, dude, you fixed it. And I said, 
I didn't fix it, man. That was Jesus. And he said, no, you don't understand. I've had lupus since I've been 12 years old. And I said, I don't care what its name is. Jesus' name is higher. You can call it Steve if you want to. It doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, and, and, he's, and this is what he said. He said, listen, I've either been too stoned on painkillers to be worth anything or too in too much pain. And I've been... I haven't taken a painkiller all day long, which in and of itself, I've had no withdrawals or no urges for it, which is crazy. And the other thing is that I haven't had any pain. I keep waiting for the other shoe to drop. He said, I'm free. And he said, I said, man, that's so awesome. And I said, and this is one of the last things he said to me. He said, I feel like I got my life back. Do you understand that it's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy? That God looks at you and He he says, This is how much you're worth to me. I do not look at the shape you're in now that I've bought you back from the enemy. Because some of the stuff that's affecting you are the lies and the pain that you've been through. And I want to get that out of you. I want to get that out of your heart. I want to get that out of your body. Do you understand that? Jesus is big enough to do that. We let him do that. We let him do that. Okay, let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for each one here. I thank you, God, for their awesome value to you. I thank you for your power. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you, Jesus, for your authority, that you have all authority in heaven and on earth. And I thank you for all that you're about to do and all that you've already done. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Y'all don't leave yet, okay? Now, now's where it gets fun. Who's got sickness or pain or something in their in their body or in their heart? You got something? What's up, buddy? Uh, I don't know. I got. I got. The world diagnosed me with like psychological problems. Like yeah. And uh, I have a feeling that's what pretty much keeps me from uh, fully often things. Okay. Okay, good. We're going to pray for you, okay? Come on up here. Yeah. Y'all stretch your hands out towards him, okay? What's your name, buddy? Harley. Harley? Yep. Isn't that cool? (laughs) All right. Yeah, Father, I thank you right now for a new Harley. In Jesus' name, right now. I take dominion over everything in him that is not of God. Every unclean spirit, every lie of the enemy, and I just expose it. In Jesus' name, I thank you, God, for filling them up. In Jesus' name, everything not of God, you command you loose him. Fill him up, Holy Spirit. I thank you for a right mind. I command right now all the confusing voices in Jesus' name. You go! You loose him now. Never come back. Anxiety and confusion is over. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Just fill him up. Good. You have anything in your body? Anything's not working right? Anything cause you pain, difficulty? No. Nope. All right, man. Thanks. Tell me how you tell me how you do tomorrow. All, All right. right. All right. Bless you, buddy. Good. Good. I don't get loud because devils are hard of hearing or God's hard of hearing. Sometimes I do that just so that I can forget about y'all because I really don't care what you think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, that's part of me because part of us like these nice religious prayers. And in this environment, I need to not do that. I need to not care what you think um, because why? That's where our authority comes from. If I want to be a pleaser of man, 
I wouldn't be a bond slave of Christ. So I'm okay for that. Okay. Um, out on the streets, I don't get loud. I don't need to. I don't need to get loud to get people healed. And I don't always get loud, but sometimes I just do it a little bit. And it's not for effect or to scare anybody. So if that bothered anyone, I just want to let you know that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Who's next? Yeah. Yeah, buddy. Come on. I've had this problem with this finger for a long time. It gets like frostbite in this winter. It really got frostbite. It gets uh-huh. frostbite even in like mild cold weather and everything uh-huh. like that. It's never, ever. Okay. Jesus, you commanded us to heal the leper and you just relax. You just relax. <laughs> Sometimes people try and so hard to believe. You just you just let Doctor Jesus touch you. You can right. think about Amen. basketball game or whatever. Because yeah, yeah, He doesn't need your help. Thank Let's you. Think about Jesus. Yeah, that's good. Thank you, Father. Right now, in Jesus' name, I command this uh, skin malady to be healed, be completely healed, no more. Proper circulation, skin be restored, muscles be restored, no more. No more in the name of Jesus. Be made new because Jesus loves him. That's good. Good. Can you move it? Yeah. I feel a little bit of warmth in this going through it. Yeah? Yeah. How about that? Amen. It's kind of like Jesus is real and I'm loves you or something? I'm not surprised, but I'm odd. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Good. Yes, ma'am. I have a, oh, I have a two abs mm-hmm. Or I can come there. I can come here. Okay. Yeah. I don't, it's a little swollen, so. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. What's your name, sweetie? Erica. Erica. Okay. In the name of Jesus right now, Father, I just release life. All pain go now. Infection go in Jesus' name. Be healed, be made new. No more pain. Tooth be restored, roots be restored. Pain leave her now. Jesus for her pain, he heals all her diseases. Thank you, Father. Good. Move it around. Check with your tongue. Check how you... Let me know how you're feeling. Do you notice any change? Just, don't, just be completely honest because I, I don't do this. There's pressure now. I was shooting. was shooting pain. Just pressure. Well, come here. I wasn't finished with you. <laughs> if, and the reason is, is because if, 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 if Jesus can make it move, He can make it leave, right? So sometimes we just need to give God a little extra time. Just, just hit it again. Not doing anything different, right? Not trying to figure nothing out. Thank you, Jesus, for complete healing right now. All the way. All the way. In Jesus' name, be completely healed and restored. No more pain. No more pressure. All infection, all inflammation, out. In the name of Jesus, tooth be made new. In the name of Jesus, Thank you, Jesus. You make all things new. You make teeth every day. Isn't that cool? It ain't hard for God to do this stuff. Sometimes we have a hard time believing that our Father's that good. But if we'd have known Jesus, we'd have known the Father. Right? Has He changed? All He's changed is His location. Now He's living in me and in you. We've got to learn to let Him flow. Bless you, sweetie. Now try. Don't move. Don't leave. It's good now. Same better or worse? A little better. A little better. Okay, so if we started off, if your pain scale was like 10, is like, you know, my jaw's about to explode, and you, well, you better... That's what it's been. Uh-huh. And what would your number be now? Is zero being, I feel perfect. Probably five. Five. Six. Wow. That's a good start, huh? Yeah. All right, I'm going to hit it one more time. All right. And then you just take three of these and call me in the morning. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus, right now for complete healing. In Jesus' name, all infection go. She's not going to lose this tooth, root, be healed. All infirmity out of her now. In Jesus' name, 
because Jesus is Lord and you will obey. That's good. Sometimes I feel these little waves of heat go in. How's that? Well. How's that? What number? Give me a number. Like. Whoa. <laughs> 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 I, I was on a mission trip to Cambodia one time, and uh, through a translator, I had a conversation with a security guard, and I, and I had a nice conversation with him, and I said, hey, do you have any, anything that gives you aches or pains in, my bo in your body? And he says, oh, i got a terrible toothache. And I said, well, I just did what I did here, but just one time. And I said, check it now. And he went... And you know how everybody in overseas knows about, like, three English phrases, right? He goes... <laughs> I love you. <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, uh, anyway, yeah. There, is there anybody that's just here for tonight that has uh, any sickness, disease, any pain, anything? And, and you don't have to be ashamed. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm on here tonight. Okay. Something I did to my knee, inside left knee. Huh? Maybe, uh, Meniscus, I don't even know. If it's Latin, I don't know. <laughs> it's pain and it needs a function, right? Yeah. Father, I thank you in the mighty name of Jesus for a brand new knee. In a brand new way. Father, thank you. Knee be healed. All pain go now. Be completely restored because Jesus loves him. Okay. Try it now. So just a twinge of pain there. Twinge of pain. Okay. Twinge. All right. It's mostly good. Huh? Yeah. Thank you for mostly good. Thank you for all the way. In Jesus' name. Knee be completely healed. Brand new. Brand new. Every muscle, every tendon, all the cartilage. You be whole, be whole, and function properly. In Jesus' name. All right, go. There was a sharp run. Yeah? Right there that time. Okay. Right there. All right. Yeah. Get out. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Right now, complete healing. Me, be whole. Be whole and be healed. No more pain. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Jesus bore his pain. Good. Good. I'll just keep on. I was better. I was better. Good. Hold on. Stay here for just a second. Is, is it 100% yet? It's really until I get down, put a little weight on my back or bar that I have. I can really tell. All right. Any of you guys like really believe this stuff but just haven't ever experienced it yet? You? Come on. Here. All right. Put your hand on just put your hand on his knee and just just repeat after me. Let's just believe Jesus together, okay? In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the power of the Holy Spirit. In the power of the Holy Spirit. Knee be healed. Knee be healed. Be whole. Be whole. Right now. Right now. Right now. Okay. Take your hands off. Try it. That was better. Good. There's that sharp pain not there. Yeah. And I'll have to get under a bar. I wait. The, and wait. That's where I usually find it. I, huh? But if I go forward like that, there's just a that sharp pain's gone. There's just the smallest uh -huh. of. So he did better than I did, didn't he? Yeah, it seems. <laughs> yeah. it All right. To let's, let's, it let's, seems better. Yeah. It's better. Let's hit it again. Yeah. Go ahead. In, in the name of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, knee be healed, be whole, now. Good.
That's a lot. That is, that's a lot. Ha 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 What's that? No, 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 it's a lot better. Okay, that's praise the Lord. I'm putting my faith into action. Amen, so. praise the Lord, Thank praise you. the Lord. Hey, he did pretty good, what you think? Oh, I like it. Yeah, that. you know that's a pastor? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I forget your name, but I'm like Bryce. Yeah, yeah. From, pastor with Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I remember because most pastors aren't good looking, but I remember uh, you. <laughs> I've, I've been, he's, he's, he stands out because he is. So. I've been hitting this myself for months, and you get better. You, you amen. You know, amen. So, but you know what? We don't get on one another's backs. I didn't. I didn't evaluate his faith. I didn't evaluate his moral life. I didn't evaluate his church or his theology. He said, "I need it. I need. I need help." Yep. And you know what? In the body of Christ, we help one another like that. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you've ever had people that have said, you know, the reason you're sick or can't get healed is because you got sin or you don't have enough mm-hmm. faith, Jesus never treated people like that. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. Ever. And even though I've been like this, I've been seeing people get healed. Amen. Put my faith into action. Oh. Amen. So even though I was like this. Amen. Amen. Okay. Oh, yeah. Great. Thank you. Again. You're welcome. I uh, was in a psycho accident four years ago. I just had shoulder All right. surgery. All right. Come here. Six months. Here. I'll, t- I'll tell you a little hint. Okay. When when you when you want ministry, I'll tell you I'll tell you a little hint. Just just say my shoulder. <laughs> Otherwise, you get people's minds too involved in the thing, um, things like that. So just my knee, my my shoulder, my back, my stomach, that kind of stuff. You go on and tell them your medical history and stuff like this. You know, people, be, oh man, I don't know about this. You know? <laughs> uh, thank you, Jesus, for His medical history being healed at the cross. In Jesus' name, shoulder be healed now. Be healed now. Everything that was damaged in the name of Jesus be completely healed and whole. Every muscle, every bone be new. In the name of Jesus. Good. Do something you couldn't do. I, I can do everything with it. I just get pain. Uh-huh. Do it now. You know. Any pain? No. You, you, you're just trying to make me feel good in front of all these guys. <laughs> he, he don't lie. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, come here. He, he had a little phrase. I don't have pain like I usually do, but is there still a little discomfort? Not right at this moment. Not right at this no, moment. No. How could that be? I don't know. It's like Jesus is real and He loves you something. Yes, amen. 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 Yes, Praise yes. the Lord. Thank you. Good. It's got nothing to do with me. And that's the neat thing about it is you realize it's who I contain. Amen. It's who you contain. Yes. In all, in, uh, it, when I was, I was in Zanzibar in October with my son. I got some cool stories from that. But I'm going to wrap up, okay? I just want to tell you, Jesus, you know how sometimes your job doesn't change, but HR pulls you in and gives you a new job description? I was over there, and, uh, and it was just awesome. It, I mean, it was awesome. We saw the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. We saw Muslims come to Christ. We saw a witch doctor come to Christ. All kinds of cool stuff. It was awesome. Now... Uh, and the, the 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 missionaries and the Christians that were there, they were like, and you know, they thought I was like really cool or something like that. And and I just and Jesus said, you know, I was, I was just with him one time, and I just, I you know, and he said, you're my limo driver. Do you know what the le- what a limo driver's job is? Is to take the superstar where he wants to go. Mm-hmm. And when the le- when the when the when the superstar says stop, I want to get out. You know what? All, all your job is to let the superstar out, so that superstar can do what superstar does. But you know what? If you walk over to the door and open the the door, and superstar gets out, and all the paparazzi start going, ching, 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 you know, and limo driver driver starts going (laughs) I'm looking pretty good you know what that's how limo drivers get fired right it ain't about limo drivers it's about superstars and do you understand that you're a limo driver too that he rides around in you and he looks good in you he got the top down he got the bass going boom 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 
Them pink fuzzy dice just going like this, man. <laughs> and he's going, whoo, whoo. And then everybody's going, chi, 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 That's Christ in you. The hope of glory. He bought you because He likes to live inside of you. He likes to be seen in you. He's not ashamed of you. He's not ashamed to be called our brother. And that's good news, ain't it? That's good news. All right, let's give Jesus a hand.